Hello. At the end of the last lecture, I said I was about to attempt something akin to the impossible. I said I would cover the millennium-long Middle Ages in 10, possibly 12 brief minutes. Better fasten your seatbelts, ladies and gentlemen. It might be a bumpy ride. Traditionally, historians have divided the Middle Ages into three fairly distinct periods. The early Middle Ages that lasted from the fall of the Western Roman Empire to the millennium, the High Middle Ages that extended from around the year 1000, give or take a few decades, to about 1300, and the Late Middle Ages that followed thereafter emerged with the Renaissance somewhere in the vicinity of 1500. Because we know so little about them, the early Middle Ages is most properly called the Dark Ages. Due to the precipitous fall in literacy, the documents simply don't exist that could enlighten us otherwise. It was also dark in the sense that it was an incredibly violent period and one that seemed to mark a step backwards for Western civilization. Throughout the period, Europe was plagued by barbarians. Early on, the Asiatic Huns and Germanic Goths of various kinds, and later by Vikings from Scandinavia. Magyars from the steppes of Central Asia and Arabs from Arabia who, though not barbarians, raided and conquered parts of Europe adjacent to the Mediterranean, including much of the Iberian Peninsula, modern Spain and Portugal. Fueled by the dynamic new monotheistic religion of Islam, the Arabs might have conquered considerably more of Europe uh, had they not been stopped at the decisive Battle of Tours in 732 in what is today France. They were stopped by a Christian army of Franks, a Germanic tribe that had converted under their King Clovis to Catholic Christianity at the end of the 5th century. The army that is said to have prevented the Islamization of Western Europe was led by a formidable Frankish warlord called Charles Martel, he must have been formidable because his name, Martel, means hammer. Though not himself a king, he exercised the power of the king, who was a mere figurehead appointed by Charles. Charles was content with the title Mayor of the Palace. After all, he wielded the real power, not the king. But his son, Pepin the Short, was having none of it. Accordingly, after receiving the approval of the Pope, Mayor of the Palace Pepin, who had by then succeeded his father, deposed the wonderfully named Childeric III, last of the incredibly lazy, do-nothing, long-haired Merovingian kings, and made himself king. He quickly founded a new dynasty known as the Carolingian in honor of his father, Charles Martel, the term Carolingian being derived from Carolus, Latin for Charles. It was during the reign of Pepin the Short's extraordinary and curiously enough extremely tall son, known to history as Charlemagne, that the glories of the Roman Empire promised, albeit for a brief moment, to return. Was it the destiny of the great Charles to restore light to an age of darkness? Well, this remarkable ruler certainly did his best, spending 38 years of his life on military campaigns, helping spread the light of Christianity to pagan lands, while carving out an empire that encompassed all of Western Europe, north of the Pyrenees. Crowned Emperor of the Romans in Rome by a grateful Pope Leo III on Christmas Day 800, and given the title Carolus Augustus, Charlemagne remained nevertheless a simple man. Almost illiterate himself, he encouraged learning in others, founding schools and inviting some of the most celebrated scholars in all of Europe, men like Alcuin of York and Charlemagne's biographer Einhard, to come to his court at Aachen in what is today Western Germany. Historians even use the term Carolingian Renaissance to describe this revival of learning over which Charlemagne presided. However, it lasted only a moment and, shortly after his death, the empire he had done so much to create fell apart. 
Europe returned to a century or two of barbarian-ridden darkness before recovering during the 11th century as the barbarian invasion ceased, Europeans learned how to produce more and better food, and towns and cities, many of which have been deserted since Roman times, revived. As Europe entered the High Middle Ages, Europeans began to look beyond the shores of the continent that they shared. This was the era of the Crusades, when men of all classes, often at great cost and risk to their lives, join military expeditions to liberate the Holy Land from the Muslim Seljuk Turks, who had conquered the region in the 11th century. Although the Crusades were ultimately unsuccessful, they brought Europeans into closer contact with the civilizations of Islam and Byzantium, which had done so much to preserve the writings of antiquity, helping revive interest in the Greek and Roman classics that led to the Renaissance. Regrettably, however, the Fourth Crusade, which never even reached the Holy Land, led to the sack of Constantinople by crusaders from Western Europe in 1204, further souring relations between Roman Catholics and Orthodox Christians. Nevertheless, it was during the century that witnessed the disastrous Fourth Crusade that medieval civilization experienced its high summer. Whether or not the 13th century was the greatest of centuries, as some claim, it was without doubt one of the most artistically fertile periods in European history. For it was during the 13th century that Western civilization experienced one of its finest moments in what is still referred to as the medieval synthesis. This was the age when Thomas Aquinas sought to reconcile faith and reason through the method of scholarship known as scholasticism. Uh, when the magnificent Gothic cathedrals like Chartres and Notre Dame were built. When Dante Alighieri wrote the Divine Comedy, described as a, a Gothic cathedral in Italian verse. And when the pontificate of Pope Innocent III inspired the term papal monarchy. Perhaps Innocent III's greatest achievement was the Fourth Lateran Council in 1215, which clarified Christian teaching and the dogma of transubstantiation. The ideal of a Europe unified in its Christian faith, the concept of Christendom, seemed more attainable than ever. But such high summers seldom last for long. Beginning in the 14th century, European civilization entered one of its darkest and most turbulent periods. For people living during the late Middle Ages, it seemed that the world itself was coming to an end. First, there were problems in the church as secular rulers competed with popes for ascendancy, leading to the so-called Babylonian captivity, when the popes resided not in Rome, but in the French-controlled city of Avignon, and thereafter to the Great Schism, when there were two popes, one in Avignon and one in Rome. For a time, there were even three popes, until the situation was resolved by the Council of Constance in 1517. Then there was war, the second horseman of the apocalypse, most especially the Hundred Years' War between France and England, but involving uh, much of Europe at one time or another. Another factor that added to the turbulence of this period, and one that was closely related to the endemic warfare of the time, was chronic unrest in the countryside and in towns and cities. The late Middle Ages saw more revolts than any period in European history. The 1378 Ciompi uprising of the poor of Florence and the English Peasants' Revolt of 1381 being among the most violent and memorable. But by far the biggest catastrophe to before Europe during the late Middle Ages was without doubt the dreadful plague known as the Black Death, one of the worst demographic disasters in human history. Arriving in Europe in 1347, it killed almost half the population, a population made weak by bad harvests and malnutrition. With the arrival of the Pale Rider, it seemed to many that the apocalypse 
was looming large. Trying to decide on a year in which the Middle Ages ended is a fairly pointless exercise, although it can be fun. The Middle Ages ended in different places at different times, much earlier in northern Italy than in Scandinavia. But if I were forced to give a date, I would not hesitate to say 1453, for it was in that year that the great city of Constantinople, New Rome as it was sometimes called, fell to the Ottoman Turks. Until then, the city founded by Constantine, the first Roman emperor to convert to Christianity, had formed the epicenter of the Christian Byzantine Empire. So its loss to the rising power of Islam was a severe shock to Christian Europe. Another reason for choosing 1453 is that within a year or two of the fall of Constantinople, a German goldsmith by the name of Johannes Gutenberg invented movable type and used it to print a Bible. Europe entered the so-called age of the printed book, one of the most important events in world history and helping to bring Europe's Middle Ages to a definitive end. Thank you very much.